our Savior and Lord, who came into the world 2,000 years ago to do something that we could never even remotely hope to do, and that is to bring us to God. And we are so grateful for that. It's a time of wonderful reflection and celebration. And this evening we're going to do it in a way that's been tradition for a number of years, and that is a, just a series of uh, lessons and carols. So we're going to read through kind of a, just snippets from the panorama of uh, the Bible's portrayal of the promise of the Christ and the fulfillment of those promises and where those promises direct us. So that's kind of what we're going to be wending our way through, and it's going to alternate between a scripture reading and a Christmas carol, kind of back and forth as we together walk through that story of what our Lord has done for us. And I would just say, if any of you are here and you have not personally received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I would just ask that you allow these scriptures and these carols to just kind of sink in, ruminate on them, because this is a special season. I know we're in difficult times, and there's a lot of despair going on in the world right now, but we have hope. We have hope because we have the Lord. We have Jesus, and so we're very grateful for that. We're grateful that you're all here. Um, if you don't have a candle or a program, please just raise your hand. We've got some extras. Hopefully everyone got one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, hey. Yeah. Right. Actually, oh, okay. Very good. Yeah, good. Oh. Because at the very end, we're all going to light candles together. The lights are all going to go out, and we're going to sing Silent Night in the Dark with just those candles. And it's just kind of a wonderful way to kind of bring in uh, the Christmas uh, experience and celebration together. Having said that, let us prepare with the prayer. Of Israel, 
and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thou thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all people, a light for all revelation of Gentiles, and for all, sorry, <laughs> and for glory to thy people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what he said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said, Mary his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is spoken against, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. And that thoughts out of many hearts may be your good. Centuries before our Savior's birth, Isaiah again prophesied, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach out to the end of the earth. And the Lord has barred his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. But the gracious irony is this, that the strong arm of God's salvation was received in the man of sorrows, crushed for our iniquities. Today, as we light this final candle of Advent, the Christ candle, we are reminded that the reason Christ came to earth 2,000 years ago was to save his people from their sins, people from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so we herald the most wondrous paradox that this small, frail package offered to God, this impotent infant, is yet the omnipotent Savior of the world, a salvation that will come through the poignancy of the cross. As Simeon, as was read, cradled the Lord's Christ, he cradled Christ the Lord. Let us pause to wonder in gratitude and awe. Let us pray. Dearest Jesus, we bow before you now as we come in our hearts to the, to the place of your humility, the cradle, for you were where you cried your simple tears and nestled near the beating heart of Mother Mary. But we do not stay there. We look beyond the cradle and we see the place of your shame, the cross, where your cruel death, where by your cruel death you paid the penalty for our sins. But we do not stay there either. We look beyond the cross and we see the place of your triumph, the resurrection, where you defeated sin and death, and sealed your reign forever as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as you came once to hear our sins, to bear our sins, so you will come a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for you. And, our, and, our, and so our hearts cry, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. And as the day family is being seated, if we can stand together and worship the Lord, angels from the realms of glory in 259.
Genesis chapter, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So remember that promise, because when we get to the turning of the New Testament, we're looking at the promises given especially to Abraham, and the promises given especially to David, and how those things have worked into their fulfillment in the coming of Jesus the Christ. It begins there in Genesis chapter 12, and it truly is a time for rejoicing. Please stand in 273. Good Christian men and women and boys and girls, rejoice! Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, 
By myself I have sworn, declared the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies, and your seed, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Please turn to, to the carol that is found in hymn 281. What child is this? Please stand. Moreover, the Lord declares to you 
that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are filled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I shall establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. When he commits iniquity, I will chasten him. The rod of men will stretch the sons of men. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. That's a magnificent promise. Please turn to your in your hymnal to hymn 244. Come, thou long expected Jesus. Please stand.
chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Sarah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. And Abijah, the father of Asa. And Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Josam. And Josam, the father of Ahab. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and, Je and his brothers, at that time, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Methan, and Methan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So, when I passed around the readings that we were going to do, um, I think it was last Sunday or the Sunday before, bless her heart, she didn't know what she had signed her up for. <laughs> but didn't she do a great job? I mean, she, that is not for sissies nor for the faint of heart. But, and, and for us, I mean, that's something we would just normally just skip to the end. But look at what is going on there. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, now remember back to where we've just been reading. And now walk through all the generations of the people waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. Waiting and waiting and waiting until finally, now you begin to feel it more. We're so um, technologically zooming so fast that genealogies mean nothing to us anymore. But for most cultures down through time, they mean everything. This is the history of the people waiting for the promise of God to be fulfilled in the coming of the Savior, the Messiah. And now he has come. So let us sing in that sense of that longing. There's a wonderful Advent carol, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Please stand. M245.
chapter 1, verses 17, or 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of God, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgins shall be a child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus.
So the seventh lesson is taken from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> this is the visit of the Magi. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we have saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what had been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was born. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Um, how many of you have had a chance to see what's been commonly called the uh, Star of Bethlehem, or the Christmas Star? The conjunction between the planets Jupiter and Saturn. It just so happens to be happening right now in this season. Well, it was probably something much more than that, that the um, Magi saw. Probably something supernatural. But it's a nice little taste. The Lord kind of throws neat things our way from time to time. And it's nice to kind of look up there and say, you know what? The Lord directs the stars, and he directs people to come to worship the newborn king. And let us be among those who do the same. Please turn in your hymnal to hymn 290, As with Gladness Men of Old. Please stand.
wise men came to worship the one who was born king of the Jews, but no one understood what that would really mean. Carol, come forward and tell us. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, Is this your own question? Or did others tell you to come to me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If, if it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you said I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And what is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, he is not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at the Passover. Would you like me to release the king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. And Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers rolled around his arms and put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked him as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now. And I understand clearly that I find no fault with him. Then Jesus came out, wearing, came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Look, here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, By our law he ought to die, because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, Where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded. Don't you realize I have the power to release you or crucify you? And then Jesus said, You would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When he said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called Stone Pavement. In Hebrew, that's Gabbatha. It was now about noon on the day of the preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, Look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called the place of the skull. In Hebrew, it's Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, and Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign over him that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that many people could read it. Then the leading priests objected and said to Pilate, Change it from the king of the Jews to he said he's the king of the Jews. But Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. So there's a rather obscure carol. I'll sing a song of Bethlehem that ties these themes together. Hymn 291, please stand. <laughs>
confirmation of this promise is heard for us in the book of Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. And there's so much richness there, uh, we cannot even begin to grasp it all in one hearing. But I'm going to voice it nonetheless. And hopefully that hallelujah will well in your hearts as you rejoice in what the Lord has done for you. If you truly have reached out to him in faith, he has done this great thing for you. Now live in that life and that hope and that peace and that joy. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Let us worship together by singing, O Holy Night, in 285. Please stand.
one of you now has a candle. And what's going to happen is I am going to light my candle. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. You'll, okay, well, I want it to be dark with all the... The only light we're going to have is the light of the candles. If you can't read Silent Night Versus, just watermelon it. And do the best you can. <laughs> But Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But then also Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, You are the light of the world. We are the light of the world only because His light has first shined in our hearts. And what we do this evening is symbolic of that very thing. I will light my candle from the Christ candle. That is the representation of Christ's light coming into the world. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this candle down to Judah, well, to Aaron, and make sure that, that we're going to pass the light around. And it is the light of Christ that you are owning and taking forward into the world with you to be the light of Christ in this dark world. I would just ask that whoever has the lighted candle, keep it straight up, bend the one that's not lit, and that way we will uh, minimize the amount of drift of wax. When everyone's candle is lit, we will sing together silently.
now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 As you extinguish your candles, please place them back in the basket as you head, head out to the back way. <laughs>